Hoffman and today I want to talk to you about how to get into an MD PhD program and giving you some of my experiences of how I applied. So first I want to let you know that applying to an MD PhD program is very similar to applying to medical school and in fact you will be going through the same exact portal as if you're applying to medical school you'll just be designating that you're applying to MD PhD programs and you'll just have to submit two additional letters which will be a research statement and an Y MD PhD essay. The next question I typically get is what major should you do when you're an undergrad to be an MD PhD student and most people actually think it's a STEM major but to be honest there's no prerequisites to what your major should be so follow your passions do what you're really interested in um, as long as you make sure you have the prerequisites for, for medical school and making sure you get in which just includes intro bio cell biology gen chemistry organic chemistry biochemistry and psychology physics sociology you have those covered You'll, have, you'll be tested on those in MCAT anyway, so it's wise to take all those courses and some of them are also prerequisites for medical school. So once you take those, you're pretty much set. Um, although I took this, the cliche way, I was a biochemistry and molecular biology major, but if I could redo it over again, I would have been a math major and just did my pre-medical prereqs and called it a day. Um, so one of the things that's really important for MD-PhD students, and I think it's kind of a misconception, is that MD-PhD students are way more competitive than medical students. And I think that's not necessarily true because I have had some pretty impressive medical class, medical school classmates. Um, I think that the cutoffs tend to be a little bit higher, but at the end of the day, we kind of round ourselves out. So I would say the minimum GPA that you would need for an MD-PhD application is a 3.5 and that's just simply from the experiences that I've seen from some of my classmates and some of my friends and some of the upperclassmen getting into programs that anything under 3.5 seemed to be very difficult to compete with um, where 3.5 and 3.7 being one of the more solid scores where after the 3.7 you have a more competitive shot. And aside from the GPA part, you have the MCAT part. And so what I've also seen is that a 508 tends to be what we're shooting for. So that's about the 80th percentile, showing that you've passed all four sections of the MCAT. And if you're looking for some of those higher tier programs, you're looking at at least a 515, I'll even say a 519, 520 for a lot of the students that I know have gotten into those programs. Um, and one thing to also emphasize is that the MCAT is a long exam. It's not something you can just up and take. You should prepare properly. And I do have a video on my channel that where I'm sitting on the panel with the AMC. Somewhere around here, if it's not somewhere around here, it's in the description below. And you can just listen to that. You can skip it through it. It's about an hour long. We have some pre-medical and pre-professional advisors giving you a, an overview of what the exam looks like, how the testing will look, and then also different styles of studying that could be useful to you. Um, I also give my input in terms of how I studied for the MCAT on there, and I also have my profile down below on the AAMC website that you can take a look at and look at all the other students there as well. And I guess it's also important to realize that this is, again, only one exam, one piece of your application. It's not the end-all be-all, but it does play a role in terms of sometimes which doors will be open for which programs. So keep that in mind. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about are extracurriculars because for me, when I was interviewing for programs, it seemed as if the programs cared a lot more about the well-roundedness and the whole person than just my medical school um, applications. I think they cared a lot more about what I did for fun, they asked me a lot more about my life, they asked me a lot more about my ambitions and my thought process, more so than just the science and the medicine, why I'm doing it. Um, those were asked, but for sure it seemed that they were asking more so about me and trying to get to know my character and how it more so mixed with my incoming classmates in the program that already exists. And so for me, what I put on my application, my extracurriculars, and making sure that I didn't do too many, I actually did, just did a few and stuck with them. Um, I made sure that I, I'm, an intro, I'm a, a, a musician, so I played in a pit band for a musical, I played at my church quite frequently, and I even took a few music classes while I was there um, in undergrad. Um, I personally did a lot of academic based things. I enjoyed helping people. So I TA'd a lot for intro bio and I also tutored math, chemistry, and biology a lot when I was an undergrad. But I did it consistently for all um, four years. And the last thing I think was very interesting to my extracurriculars was my, my participation in the student judicial board, which I thought was very interesting because that was the furthest thing from medicine, but the thought process was very similar. You're sitting and overlooking cases of non-academic disputes, which are typically anything from alcohol um, abuse, um, illegal drug possessions, or things of um, assaults, things on campus, any non 
uh, non-academic uh, infringements against the code of student conduct. And I thought it was really interesting because we sat in a, a hearing, which is basically an interview, where the pa- where the, each person tells us their part of the story, the defendant, um, and the person who's uh, prosecuting, in a sense. These are it's not legal court, but these are the words that's coming to mind right now. But I thought it was really interesting because it left a lot of gray areas because you're relying on human nature and human memory. And you're using that to kind of make a decision on what will be affecting these students' lives. Sometimes it will actually stop them from coming to school. They could be suspended or even expelled. So I thought it was very interesting in kind of practicing those, those judgment calls in terms of what to do and also learning about restorative practices and positive uh, reinforcements for some people who are sometimes doing, making really silly mistakes. Um, so I thought it was a very interesting thing to talk about during my interviews and it was a very fun experience for me. I learned a lot about myself and I also learned some really cool skills. And so the next thing you want to talk about is service, service learning and your, your giving back to the community. So at the end of the day you are applying to medical school and at the heart of medicine is service. You're helping people help themselves and also some people who can't even help themselves. So the ability to show that you can do that even before medical school is super important. And so for me, I did that in a very simple way. I did a lot of um, community service. Um, I would perform at a lot of assistant living homes or senior citizen homes around the holidays because they're so used to live music. And for me, I love to perform. So that was just hand in hand, worked really well around the holiday seasons. Um, my church will also organize lots of community events where they'll either feed the community or invite them in um, for Christmas time, giving um, presents to the, to the kids. And that will always be a fun time of the year. And I also volunteer a lot at my high school. I mentor a lot of those students and helping a lot, especially the first generation students, um, college students, where they would apply for scholarships, helping them write their personal statements, understanding what the application process looked like. And so to me, that was something that I really enjoyed doing and I still do today. And so the other thing that I had added to my, my service was also volunteering at the hospital, which is super important. I think it should be separate from the shadowing of the hours because understanding how the hospital works, which is a system, an integrated system in and of itself, um, is super important for applying for medical school. Not just to understand what a physician does, but understanding where the roles of the nurse is, how do you, uh, what does it look like for having HIPAA compliance, not just in the hands of the physician, but in all the hands that are being, um, the information is being exchanged between. And so it makes you more confident of the system that you're walking into versus just the one single role that you'll play in the future. Um, so with that being said, we can go to shadowing. So interestingly enough, I did not shadow before getting into medical school. But for reasons, just the fact that I couldn't find anyone that would actually, after I would reach out to them, would let me shadow. Um, but at the end of the day, it didn't keep me out of medical school, but it did in fact hold me back for a few programs. I was told for some programs that they couldn't convince the medical school that I was interested in medicine because I did not shadow. Um, I could have written a letter telling them about my interesting situation that would have let them know that I know what a physician does, but I didn't do it. It did keep me out of a few programs, but at the end of the day, I still got into programs that I'm quite happy with. Um, and so the next part to me is super, super important, and that's research, research, research. So a lot of people joke that physician scientists should be called scientist physicians, simply because the program is more so focused on having these research-minded individuals who are training in medicine to understand human disease in a very different way. That way we can treat and create new therapies than the way they're currently being created. And so that means, with that being said, you have to have a, a minimum, and I'm saying a minimum, a minimum of two years of research. Um, I would even say three years a standard. Most of the students who tend to come into MD PhD programs take gap years, they do master's programs, and have a significant research portfolio. Um, and so not only just being in a lab for two years or for three years, but showing that you're productive, showing that you can produce papers, presentations, abstracts, posters, um, and even grants. So making sure you're able to take ownership of your work and clearly explain what you did and understand why you did what you did. Because at the end of the day, when you're pursuing your PhD, you have to be able to take a project from the conception, the idea phase, to its completion. And so that has to have at least some, some evidence of you being able to do that before coming into the MD-PhD program. And it's super, super important. Um, and for me, I like to stress the importance of a sustained research experience. So for me personally, I stayed in the same undergraduate lab from the end of my freshman year to the end of my senior year. And I only interrupted that one summer to take a summer away to do an internship at a different institution, and then that was it. 
Um, the next part was also really important, especially for physician scientists who tend to be very much traditional and have research being one of the main parts of their career. Um, so the personal statement, the YMD PhD essay, and your research um, statement are super important, not only because you need to write them to get into medical school and get into your graduate school, so your MD PhD program, but in this career you'll be writing forever. <laughs> because you have to write grants, you have to write letters of recommendations, you have to write papers. And so you have to be able to communicate clearly on a piece of paper so that people can see exactly what you're thinking and that they will support you and also you're able to run your lab and run your career. So the way that I approach my personal statement and my, my different works were just based on rhetoric. So this is not common, but this is the way I chose to do it. So when I wrote my personal statement, I wrote it with the full intention of evoking emotion. I wanted the readers to understand the conviction that I felt about me never giving up, the persistence that I have, and that no matter what is thrown at me, I can overcome it. And so I gave them very concrete examples of some of the struggles and obstacles that I went through, and not everyone has to write a sob story, but for me, I thought it was really important that since I, I went through quite a bit, and that I've overcome quite a bit, to show that those are my qualities that will help me get through this challenging program over the course of the next eight years. And so for my YMD PhD program, I wrote that very much as my logical piece. That was my logos. And so that logical piece was trying to understand and help them understand that I'm not coming for a free MD. It's understanding that for me, I was very interested in biomedical research and I was very interested in diseases and human diseases. And so for me, it was very silly to study a human disease in the absence of the human experience. And so for me, having an MD-PhD helps complete that circle where you have the context of the human disease and human experience that you can take back to the lab to actually create a more comprehensive therapy and therapeutic. And then finally, the research essay for me was more so that sense of ethos, that sense of credibility. So showing all the things that I've done, talking about all the projects that I've completed, and so they can actually see exactly my understanding of my work and that I can communicate that clearly on a piece of paper, which is important for publications and important for grant writing. Um, so I took those all very seriously, and I think those you should too. Um, I will actually link those down below so you can actually take a look at them. I think it would be very interesting just to read another person's um, work and see what an application that gets students into empty PhD programs actually look like. And the last uh, piece of the application are letters of recommendation. So making sure you can build these strong relationships and get glowing letters before you get there. I think the worst case scenario is you get a lukewarm letter. So make sure that when you're asking for letters, you're asking for a strong letter of recommendation. And people will not be offended by this. You make sure you're writing, asking for a strong letter of recommendation because you want to make sure that you're presented in your best light. And so for me, I wound up getting three research letters and then two professor letters from my courses. I had one professor who had taught me and I also TA'd for him. So you got a chance to see me from a student perspective as well as an instructor perspective where I not only learned and did well in the course, but I was also able to transfer that information to a new group of students. Um, then I also had another professor who happened to be my academic advisor and my biochemistry professor, and she was also a really great letter writer. Um, and it also helped that I rotated through her lab. Um, and the last two letters were from another rotating professor that I rotated through the lab with. Um, my research uh, professor from when I was in high school, actually, I wound up publishing with him when I was in college, and then I sustained research from undergrad. And so those five letters provided a really good foundation and really good complement to my application, making it a very strong application. So hopefully with all that, you understand all the pieces that go into applying to an MD-PhD program, and you feel confident that you can actually get in as well. And now that you know the statistics and the metrics, as well as the other aspects that programs are looking for. So if you have any other questions, drop them down in the comments below.